Welcome in, everybody. It is time to talk some orange-white preview spring football. I'm Chip Brown of Horns247.com, joined by the managing editor of Horns247, Taylor Estes. Taylor, beautiful weather outside. It is time. We are we are down to uh, one more spring practice on Thursday, and then the orange white game on Saturday at one o'clock and then football will go back into its um, spring hibernation, summer hibernation, spring, spring summer <laughs> hibernation and resurface in August. But let's uh, let's get into it because um, there's, there's, there should be excitement yeah. among the fan base um, w- with regard to this football team. And they're, might be more, you know, there's also cause for concern. We'll get into that as well, but we definitely want to preview this orange white game because a lot of new faces, the transformation of this football roster under Steve Sarkeesian, the last two years, which has been impressive to say the least rebuilding the uh, offensive line for sure. Uh, three quarterbacks on campus who are, Steve Sarkeesian's hand-picked guys who's going to replace Bijan Robinson and Roshan Johnson at the running back position. And, and where's the defense in its progress? Um, Gary Patterson, no longer an analyst uh, at Texas, but this coaching staff has a lot of talent to work with and uh, they brought in some help from the transfer portal, in Arkansas, Transfer safety, Jalen Catalan, Wake Forest, cornerback Gavin Holmes. So a lot to get into here. Yeah, there is. And, you know, I, unfortunately for Texas fans, you may not be able to see Jalen Catalan in action just because they're um, holding him out of the spring game um, with the shoulder injury he did suffer at Arkansas. But, yeah, there's a, there's a ton of storylines that we have to talk about today, Chip, leading up to this spring game. And, I mean – I feel like we would be doing everyone a disservice if we didn't start with quarterback, right? I mean, this is quarterback is any, any time there's any talk about quarterback at Texas, people are going to tune in. They're going to want to hear about that. And I think that's a good place to kind of start our preview is where the quarterback position is. And, you know, with Quinn Ewers being in year two of Steve Sarkeesian's offense and the progression of receivers. Yeah. And I, I think there's a lot of excitement around, Quinn Ewers and his change of mindset, the change of his look, not just cutting his hair and trimming his beard, but, you know, he's leaner. But from what I'm hearing, he's in great shape. He's stronger and has had a really good spring. And with all the new faces in the receiving core and um, a new cast of running backs trying to push their way to the top of the depth chart in replacing Bijan Robinson and Roshan Johnson. It's put more on the shoulders of Quinn Ewers to be a leader uh, of this offense vocally. And according to his teammates, he has answered that challenge. So I think I'm excited to see what Quinn Ewers looks like, how he carries himself. I know it's going to be vanilla. I know we're not going to, um, get into the the game planning and and what this you know the offensive identity it's going to be pretty basic but you still want to see Quinn Ewers command this offense throw the football complete passes and and how you know how he's carrying himself because you know Steve Sarkeesian set out to improve the passing game that was the number one priority for this football team going into spring football And a lot of that has to do with the growth and development of Quinn Ewers. He only completed 58% of his passes last season. Um, That's not, I mean, that's a a high level college quarterback is completing, you know, 60 to 65, 65% or higher. Um, You know, Colt McCoy had the NCAA record when he left Texas um, you know, completing closer to 70% of his passes. Um, so, you know, 
you want to see that growth and development from, from Quinn Ewers. And that comes with being more familiar, more comfortable with all the nuances of this offense. And, and that's a huge storyline uh, for this spring because um, he is the guy make no mistake about it. We'll get into that in a minute, but um, he's the guy Taylor. Yeah. And I mean, with, with that, you know, you, you brought up the good point that that was Steve Sarkeesian's number one priority this spring, as you had said, but it doesn't just fall on Quinn Ewers. It's also the receivers, you know, and, and Texas has done a really good job of bringing in, you know, new talent, young talent, experienced talent at the receiver position. And that's only going to help. Obviously the, the progression of Isaiah Nayer, coming back from that ACL injury is another thing, you know, Quinn Ewers didn't have that weapon to utilize last season, but it, it all falls on, on Ewers first, but then also you have to look at also the receivers too. I mean, like, I think it's fair for us to say that we can't lie and be like, Oh, the, the passing game solely was not great all the time last season because of Quinn Ewers. No, I mean, there were plenty of times where Quinn Ewers was throwing very, very, very catchable balls for even mid-level receivers that were not getting caught. You know, it was there was there was miscues in the passing game more so than just from the quarterback throwing the ball. There was receiver issues too. But I'm really excited not only to see Quinn Ewers in more of a game setting, but also to see these weapons in full action. Because when we've been out at practice, there's been minimal practices that we've been able to see. A handful, like I'll give Texas credit. They gave us, I think, more practice access this spring than they had um, in recent years. That usually happens when a coach is starting to feel a little bit more confident about the team that he has in practice and taking the field, knowing that media members are going to write about it. But, you know, I do think we haven't really seen the full picture of what the receiving core is going to look like, what the guys like John Tay Cook, what DeAndre Moore, what, um, you know, A.D. Mitchell, these names that we're hearing that are standing out in practices, we haven't necessarily seen them in full action. And in order for the the passing game as a whole to get better, they also have to, you know, answer the call a little bit. And that, I think those, those two go hand in hand, kind of coincide with one another. Um, I would, you know, obviously quarterback taking that next step is humongous, but 1B, I would say, from priority is going to see what these receivers look like, too. And this will be the first opportunity that we really see them in full action. That's right. We've seen Jordan Whittington. We've seen Xavier Worthy. We've seen Casey Kane. Um, but we have not seen uh, A.D. Mitchell, number mm -hmm. five, the transfer from Georgia, who's who's caught uh, touchdown passes in four college football playoff games, including the national championship win uh at Georgia over uh, TCU and the game winner over Ohio state in the semifinal. Um, we have not seen Jonte cook number two, uh, a dazzling route runner for a, a freshman and Deandre Moore demo they're calling him. We have a new demo Taylor. A new one. <laughs> and you know, John a Barron said, I didn't realize how fast this guy is. He is in and out of his breaks. He's exploding out of his breaks. And he's the first receiver um, mentioned by John A. Barron when you're asking him, okay, who stood out to you? He said, Demo. I really like Demo. He said, John T. Cook has his route running, but Demo's really fast. And, and so um, that's another name that, uh, you know, we've also heard has been really comfortable and, and I wrote in the insider last week that, you know, team sources have told me that Jonte Cook and DeAndre Moore are on the same growth curve that Xavier Worthy was on as a true freshman. And Xavier Worthy was not an early enrollee like these guys. So that's that's really encouraging. Now you got to see it under the lights. You got to see it um, take shape on the field and we'll get a little glimpse of it in in. Uh, you know, this orange white game. Uh, but those are definitely three guys that you're going to have your eye on because Isaiah Nair, um, number eight. Now he's changed his number. Xavier worthy went from eight to number one. So Isaiah Nair, um, went from 18 to eight. And I don't know how much we're going to see Isaiah Nair. Obviously he's, he tore his ACL last fall. He's been, uh, not a full participant this spring, 
So good chance we, we won't see him, but um, you know, we'll see him in warmups, I guess. Yeah. And, um, and so you're right. That's a big part of it. The offensive line uh, is a big part of it. Five starters back, but Cole Hudson who started every game at right guard is out still recovering from um, surgery to repair a torn labrum. And here's a little interesting nugget from Steve Sarkeesian today. You'll probably see Cam Williams, um, the behemoth, um, but fleet footed (laughs) offensive lineman, probably playing some right guard in the orange white game um, because DJ Campbell, the highly touted, uh, interior lineman in the, in the 2022 recruiting class, uh, is going to be held out of the orange white game. Steve Sarkeesian didn't give us a, a reason for that, but, um, sounds like he's a little dinged up, but, uh, Cameron Williams, number 56, number 56 in your program, Keep an eye on uh, Big Cam because he's going to be one of the first team offensive uh, line starters in this orange white game. And uh, he's a guy I'm very interested to see, Taylor. Yeah. And he's hard to miss. You can't really, you know, not keep your eye out for him because even in that big offensive line room, that looks like the how the offensive line should look like at any, you know, power five <laughs> college football program, something Texas didn't have for a while. Um he still stands out. He's a big guy, as Chip said, you know, six foot seven. What's he at now? Wait, is he 370? Some, is that what? You know, something. The, the latest, they, and they, they've applauded him because he's down from 374 to 360. 360. Okay. So he was 374 win last year. Okay. Yeah. And um, yeah. He's put in a lot of work to remake his body. Yeah. And this is a guy too. If you listen to the flagship podcast, you know, you probably are like, oh my gosh, Taylor, stop talking about this. But it's, it's relative because this is a guy that, that Kyle Flood singled out multiple times in the time that we were able to talk to him at the Alamo Bowl during breakout sessions. You know, we don't get to talk to uh, coordinators or assistant coaches, um, except for like once a year or a bowl game. But Kyle Flood kept talking about the development and progress that he was seeing on a day-to-day basis in practice from Cam Williams. And that was a guy that has progressed probably more than he's getting credit for because people don't see it on the outside because it was in practice. Well, now we're going to be able to see it. And if I hear an offensive line coach, especially one like Kyle Flood, who, you know, obviously knows what he's doing is recruiting at the highest level, probably I would say um, the best offensive line recruiter, I've seen in my career at Texas, um, you know, I I don't think that's, you know, speaking out of turn by saying that, but if he's pointing to a guy like that, when we're just talking ball, like, you know, not in a formal interview session, I'm going to be looking out for that guy. And so Cam Williams, hundred percent chip, I think it's going to be really fascinating to see, especially him line up at right guard. You don't expect a body like him really to be at guard. You expect him to be more at tackle, but I think you're going to see that athleticism that we've heard so much about of him, which sounds wild when you're talking about a big human that's 360 pounds, but the he's kind of a freak athlete too. We're going to kind of see the versatility he brings to this offensive line. Yeah. And um, you've got uh, obviously Calvin Banks on the left side, Hayden Connor at, at left guard, Jake Majors, your center, Connor Robertson, who is being groomed. Uh, as the backup to Jake Majors is uh, has not been a full participant in the spring. He had wrist surgery, so they're being careful with him in terms of contact. So um, that's Taylor. That's part of the reason that you know in some of our scrimmage reports, they're they're you know the when the number one defense has faced the number two offense, there have been breakdowns in in the protection with the number two offensive line in part because and and nothing against Sawyer Gorm Welch, but he's been the, the number three center. He's a guy who started his career at Texas on the defensive line. Um, You've got to have that center position solidified, confident, um, strong, obviously when you're going up against a defensive line as talented as Texas has. So, um, 
you know, you're, you're also looking to see who's emerging uh, among the freshmen in that 2023 recruiting class uh, guys like, you know, Peyton Kirkland and Andre Kojo and Connor Stroh. Um, and I'm hearing that, you know, Peyton Kirkland and Andre Kojo are pushing hard uh, to be the backup to Calvin Banks left tackle. So we'll, we'll get a little glimpse uh, of, of the offensive line progress with, uh, with some of the newcomers as well. Talk about a full 180, right? Last year at this time, they didn't even have too, too deep for offensive linemen that they couldn't even play a real spring game. Now, you know, we're talking about true freshmen that are pushing Kelvin Banks at left tackle. I mean, that that should go to show the work that Kyle Flood has done for this offensive line ship. I mean, my goodness, like it's night and day different. Um, and you cover Texas for 30 years now, I think, right? Yeah. I'm aging you. Sorry. <laughs> They're almost 31 years. I mean, when you look at this offensive line, do you get more of, you know, n- not necessarily like comparing them, you know, toe to toe or anything, but does this look more like the offensive lines that you would see and cover in the more glory days of Texas football under Mac Brown in the early 2000s? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because, you know, you look at that offensive line in 2005 where you had Lyle Senline at, at center and Casey Stuttered at guard. Casey Stuttered was an undersized guard. I mean, he was barely 300 pounds, 6'2". I'm not sure he would even be recruited by this <laughs> coaching staff because the one thing that just absolutely grabs your attention and anyone who goes to the spring game, if you can get down close to the field, which you should be able to, um, it's a spring game. <laughs> You'll be amazed at just how big Texas's offensive linemen are. I mean, they are, they look like an SEC offensive line. And if they're, you know, if they can stay together, grow together and continue to build that bond, then Texas will be SEC ready when they make the move uh, in the fall of 2024, because they you know, Steve Sarkeesian came in and said privately, you know, that he wasn't, you know, he's brought in to match wits with Lincoln Riley at OU. Now Lincoln Riley's at, you know, in Steve Sarkeesian's old job at USC. But Sarkeesian said more than that, we're going to build an SEC style football team. And, and that turned out to be just what the doctor ordered with this move to the SEC. So, um, I mean, if you get down close to the field for that spring game, you'll see what we're talking about. This this offensive line group is impressive, and and they can move. It's not, you know, Mac Brown used to recruit, and he used to get slammed for this. Mac wanted to have his recruiting class kind of kind of wrapped up after the junior days, and like going into the the fall, um, you know, he didn't really wait for any late. Um, blooming players. He kind of, you know, grabbed what, uh, you know, the guys that he thought were um, the best players, you know, the spring before their um, senior year. And some of those offensive linemen kind of got fat and happy and, and didn't come in in the best shape. And maybe they weren't the best movers, but that, is not the case anymore. And so Texas obviously um, recruiting at a high level on the offensive line. And um, that's a big reason for, for confidence this year. When you look at this offense and its ability to improve the passing game and break in a new starter at running back. Yeah. And when you talk about like the guys that, you know, not trying to go way back in history or anything like that. um, But when you do talk about some of the guys that Mac Brown recruited and wanting to get ahead of, you know, getting his classes kind of secured early on. Um, I had a coach one time told me that used to coach against Texas that, you know, you would see Texas come out and this was later in Mac Brown's career, come out of the tunnel. And your first thought is like, Oh my gosh, these are, these guys look like physical specimens and he's like, but they were, they look like Tarzan play like Jane type of players. Like they just weren't, they didn't, they may have looked the part, but they didn't play up 
consistently to what their skill level probably could have been. And that's not the case now. These guys look like Tarzan and they're mean. I mean, Calvin Banks, you heard the story about, you know, you want mean offensive linemen. You want Casey Studder may have been undersized, but that dude, you don't want to mess with him. Like, my goodness, I still wouldn't want to mess with Casey Studder to this day. I mean, he's a nice guy. If you like get him away from the football field, I don't want to meet him on the football field, like, or in the dark alley or anything like that. Cause I'd be running for my life. You know, most people would, those are the, that's more the mentality that it seems like the guys that they are recruiting, not that they're all like meet like, you know, bad guys or anything. They're just what you want your offensive line to look like in the mentality to have and it seems like that you know this staff knows what they're doing and it's definitely not it doesn't seem like it's shaping up to be oh they look the part but they're not going to play the part yeah they're nasty Mm -hmm. and and that's that's what you want you want to see that across the board and um impose your will and and so um definitely some some good things to look for in this orange white game when it comes to the offensive line and then you know, obviously you've got the all, first team, all big 12 tight end in Jatavian Sanders. Gunnar Helm is getting a lot of praise, number 85, for continuing to grow and develop his game. And Jatavian Sanders saying that, you know, Gunnar Helm's really pushed him to be better. And and so, you know, you've got two really talented tight ends. Juan Davis, it sounds like, is still trying to grow into the, you know, being the blocker and the pass catcher and not just the pass catching tight end. Um, And then, you know, they'll, they'll add a freshman uh, in the summer uh, at that position. And, and so, you know, you know what you've got with Jatavian Sanders, but the running back position, Taylor, we actually can learn some stuff in this spring game about that position because um, I don't know how much they're going to play Jonathan Brooks. Uh, he's been um, limited, obviously, coming off the hernia surgery. And and so it's been a lot of Jaden Blue, number 23, and a lot of uh, Cedric Baxter Jr., number four, and, and Savion Red, the very, very interesting uh, receiver turned running back who's who got big praise after the second scrimmage of the spring for this stiff arm he delivered where he just shoved Justice Finkley out of his way and kind of opened some eyes on that coaching staff as to, wow, this is a former receiver. He's just throwing, you know, 250 pound guys out of his way. And Savion Red, interesting guy, number 17. He's making some plays. Um, I've said he's, I don't know when his impact is going to happen, but I think he's going to be an impact guy and we're going to get a glimpse of him on Saturday. Yeah. And with Keelan Robinson, he will also, he's been, um, you know, withheld from full participation this spring too. So this is, this is a great opportunity as we've talked about chip on the flagship podcast and the weeks leading up to this. I mean, uh, for these guys to really make a claim for themselves. I mean, Let's be real. Jaden Blue has not had the opportunity to even show what he has. I mean, he was what fifth fifth string last season. I think you would consider him behind Bijan Roshan, Keelan, and Jonathan Brooks. I mean, this is a guy. This was a really you know highly touted recruit. Obviously, his recruiting ranking kind of dropped after he decided to um, sit out of his senior year of high school. Um, but still, I mean, he hasn't even scratched the surface or showed anything of what he can be at running back. And then, you know, CJ Baxter being, I think he was, he was number one running back, I believe in the country in the 2023 signing class. This is a guy that, I mean, we had his high school coach on uh, a few weeks back. And if you didn't listen to that interview, go back and uh, look through that. I I don't remember the exact date, so I can't really help you there. But um, I mean, hearing what he has to say about Cedric, Uh, or CJ Baxter, Cedric Baxter. I think they still have him listed as Cedric Baxter on the roster, but um, it's, it's impressive, you know? And so, um, and then as you mentioned, Savion Red, I mean, this is the guy that moved positions, the three, the trio of running backs that should be getting the bulk of the work on Saturday all need to prove themselves. And what better way than this is almost like shaping up to be the perfect opportunity for them to do that. Um, Obviously Steve Sarkeesian is not afraid to, have multiple running backs carry the ball too. So whether 
you know, Jonathan Brooks, when he's 100% healthy, if he's just the automatic go-to number one back, these guys still are going to have the opportunity for substantial carries, substantial reps, substantial playing time. Um, but I'm excited to see it, honestly, because we haven't seen Jaden Blue in full action. We haven't seen Cedric Baxter in full action. Um, we haven't seen physic personally, you know, firsthand Savion Red in full action at running back. So this is, I, I'm very intrigued. I would say I might be more intrigued to see the running backs over the offensive line. I would probably go like quarterback, receiver, running back, or the the kind of you know groups that I would say one, two, three of priorities for me. But um, that kind of rhymed. <laughs> but yeah, I mean that's a that's going to be really fascinating, and we're going to see how much they're going to even utilize the run game. That's something I'm going to also watch because is it if they're not utilizing it very much, are they kind of showing their hand that maybe Jonathan Brooks is going to just step in when he's hundred percent healthy and just be the guy and they don't want to give false hope. I don't know. I mean, there's so many different ways you can kind of look at this, but it's, it's no shortage of storylines for sure. Yeah. And that's a huge, um, you know, you have 10 starters back on offense, but the, the one starter you got to replace is, you know, really two starters with B. John Robinson and Roshan Johnson and two of the best, in college football last year. And I think we're going to find that out on draft day um, coming up later this month. So um, this is, you know, this is going to be a a lot of fun. And then when you flip it and you go over to the defense, that was the turnaround story of the year last year. And the, the defensive line became a strength. You lose Moro Ojimo, you lose Keandre Coburn, but, Everything we're hearing is that Byron Murphy and Tavon Dre Sweat have taken over and maybe even improved on that position, which is which is huge. I mean, if that's true, then then there's a real chance for this defense to to be better in 2023. Um, obviously, Baron Sorrell is a guy that Steve Sarkeesian keeps mentioning uh, at that defensive end position Um, he's you know gotten stronger he's gotten more confident he had five and a half sacks last year but he's setting the edge in the in the run game and showing an ability to get to the quarterback and um, and then you've got you know guys who are trying to replace Ovia Gofu at the other end position Justice Finkley Ethan Burke Colton Vasek um, Jamon Tapp let's see how those rotations and reps go um, because you, you should pay attention because the coaches don't, they don't do anything um, without intention. And the first guys out there are the guys who've been playing the best in the spring. And, and so, you know, I'm, I'm going to be watching those guys really closely. And then number zero, Anthony Hill, This guy I'm hearing is coming off the edge and making things happen. He is causing fumbles. And this is one thing, if you read, if you're a, you know, subscriber to Horns 24 seven, I've written a lot about Anthony Hill this off season. And I don't typically, (laughs) I I don't typically write about true freshmen who haven't done anything yet. But when you talk to the people who've coached Anthony Hill, uh, he was a stud at Denton Ryan. He played there with Jatavian Sanders, who said, keep an eye on this guy. He's going to surprise this year. But his coaches, in talking to them at Denton Ryan, um, they said, when we needed to get a pass rush, we moved Anthony Hill up to the line, and the guy has a knack for getting his hand on the football and and caught stripping, stripping the quarterback, stripping a running back. And it's happening again. It's happening this spring. And so look to see where, and Steve Sarkeesian mentioned Anthony Hill today as a pass rusher. I said, your number two priority going into spring was to, you know, affect the quarterback uh, better than you did last year. Who are the guys who've stood out pass rushing? And he said, Byron Murphy from the defensive tackle position and Anthony Hill, the linebacker who, They've moved up into that Sam role on, you know, pass rush situations and the guy is making things happen. So I can't wait to see number zero out there on defense. Uh, We have a new agent zero Taylor. (laughs) His name is Ant Hill. 
Yeah. And, and like even the linebacker core too, I think in general, you know, just um, with DeMarvey and Overshone moving on, uh, that's a big, you know, big shoes to fill. I'm watching all, you know, guys like Anthony Hill, Leonga Lafau, um, you know, Mo Blackwell's been a guy that Sark has mentioned. Same with David Benda. I mean, the, I would say the front of the defense in general, not just the line is going to be something Texas fans are going to want to watch because while Texas is losing a lot, like I, I don't want to, I don't want to underplay um, the losses that they are losing with Keandre Coburn, with Moro Ojimo, with uh, Demarvian Overshone. Even go back in the back of the defense, you know, Deshaun Jamison, um, Anthony Cook. Those are guys that played a lot of football for Texas, a lot of college football at a high level. Um, there's going to be a lot of guys, or you know, a lot of holes to fill, but it doesn't seem like there's as much of a concern when you hear Sark talk about them. And like, I, I don't like, you know, we're still kind of learning Sark a little bit. I feel like we have a pretty good understanding of how he at least deals with the media when it comes to answering questions. Um, it takes a little bit of time to kind of figure it out. But if you've been in the media for, I would say even like five years, you'll start learning how to read the answers <laughs> and read the room a little bit. And Sark seems pretty confident still in that. Am I am I misreading that ship? Because no. if, if Sark if Sark feels that way, I'm like, this defense might be pretty pretty good. And I don't want it to be like I'm disrespecting or disregarding the guys that left because that those were really talented guys too. But this could be something that could be huge for Texas this season. You'll get the first look on Saturday. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jalen Ford. I mean, mm -hmm. he's the. He's the mission control in the middle of that defense and his confidence, his communication. Um, the guys all have confidence in him. And I think that trust is growing. And that's a trust that was not there two years ago. Right. Um, this was a defense that would crumble in, mm -hmm. in difficult situations. Now they're a defense that rallies the team that, I mean, against TCU when the offense couldn't do a thing, the defense was scooping and scoring in the fourth quarter to make it a one possession game and keep Texas in it. Uh, yeah. Jade Barron uh, with that scoop and score and Jade Barron, who um, I heard was in a green Jersey today. So maybe he's limited uh, for the, for the spring game, but Jade Barron led the team in tackles for loss. This guy's a star and uh, he's a guy, I think, the whole defense has a lot of trust in. He plays a really critical position uh, in that nickel star position in, in Pete Kwiatkowski's defense because he's got to, you know, come up against the run. He's got to take on fast slot receivers. And as a former corner, he can do it. And so, you know, that leads us into the secondary, Taylor. And if there's, you know, some question marks, it's okay, you've got a lot of talent at that field corner position with Terrence Brooks and Gavin Holmes and Malik Muhammad. And, you know, Austin Jordan's been working more at nickel um, mm -hmm. behind Xavier Bryce. Yeah. Behind Johnny Barron, but Xavier Bryce. Right. And, you know, these guys are all six feet long arms. They've got the, the frame, the speed. That's going to be fun to watch mm -hmm. on, uh, on Saturday. Who's getting the, the, reps uh, that matter you know I keep hearing Terrence Brooks has been really physical uh, Gavin Holmes has been really smart he had a huge interception at the end of the scrimmage last weekend to kind of win it for the for the defense and uh, he's a guy who has gotten praise pretty much all the way through spring um, but Terrence Brooks came on late last year I mean You've got depth. You've got depth at the corner position. And then that leads us also, I don't want to be Debbie Downer here, but Steve Sarkeesian said we're probably going to have activity coming and going in the transfer portal after the spring game. So what what does that mean? Where right. where's is some of that depth gonna um you know be affected by uh the transfer portal positively or negatively? We'll have to wait and find out. But uh at safety. You know, no Jalen Catalan for the orange white game, but Jaron Thompson and, you know, Keaton Crawford has been praised kind of across the board as the guy who's, you know, really asserted himself the most this spring with that opportunity uh, next to, to Jaron Thompson. 
it's been fantastic. Steve Sarkeesian said, you know, his communication, his physicality, he's a former corner. So he's got the speed. Um, I mean, he basically said Keaton Crawford might be the most improved player of spring football. So um, he's number 21 and he's a special teams monster for this, for this football team. And um, he's a guy who's pushing hard, trying to make sure that he's in the rotation. Yeah. And, and that's big, you know, he, he kind of, he made the move. What was it? Was this last spring that he made the move? I think it was to right. safety. Yeah. Safety. And, and it was kind of, there was early hype in spring um, about his move there. And then it kind of just, you know, flatlined a little bit when you, like, we didn't hear much about Keaton Crawford in the development. You did see it on special teams a lot, but yeah, I think his speed being a former corner is something that will be really beneficial to the safety position for Texas. Um, and with Jalen Catalan, he's another guy, you know, with Keaton, with Jalen Catalan still rehabbing his, his shoulder injury, Keaton Crawford's kind of in a similar position as say like a Jalen, a, um, Jaden blue or a, a CJ Baxter, given an opportunity to really secure and submit himself in the secondary. And he needs to, I mean, he's, you know, a senior, he's got it. it it's now or never for him. Um, you know, they obviously brought in Jalen Catalan thinking they, if he stays healthy, probably that should be a, a wake up call, I think for Keaton Crawford. And, and I, it sounds like it, maybe it was honestly with him the, being a guy that Steve Sarkeesian is talking about his progress, his development, and really making the most of this opportunity with uh, the guy that they brought in, not being able to go full go yet in spring ball. Yeah. And, you know, there's a depth issue <clears throat> at safety. Um, mm -hmm. You know, not only Catalan being out for the, for the spring, um, but, you know, you've got Jaron Thompson, you've got Keaton Crawford. After that, it's a little bit of a mystery. And so, you know, you get Derek Williams, the Raptor, Coming in in June, he's another one of my man crushes, and, <laughs> and he's gonna, you know, he's he's gonna get here in June. Um, but you're you're looking to see where where Larry Turner Gooden is, where's where's BJ Allen, are are e either of these guys gonna make a play on Saturday that uh, you know that turns ahead and and makes you know makes you say, oh, okay, all right, there's. Um, you know, they're comfortable enough where if, if they had to play, it's not, it's not uh, a massive drop off. So, um, you know, that's, that's a, if, if you, if you're nitpicking concerns about this football team, it's the depth at safety. And also how far has the backup quarterback position come? Because yeah. really everybody's looking at Malik Murphy almost as a first year guy because of all the ups and downs of his injuries last year. And, and Arch Manning, you know, yeah, they're both super talented. They're both going to be a hell of a lot better in year two than they are right now. And if yeah. something happened to Quinn Ewers, I don't know how many, you know, people on the team would feel great going into battle with, you know, Malik Murphy and Arch Manning right now, because they're, they're still learning. They're just now really getting their, you know, teeth into this offense. Yeah. I mean, Malik Murphy has had what, two weeks of practice, not even yet. Right. I mean, that, you know, that is a, the situation he's in. And I know there's probably going to be some rival fan bases that say that we're making excuses already for the quarterbacks, but it's true. I mean, Malik Murphy literally was injured all last year. He was a third string guy even then, or he may have even been fourth string, my goodness, behind Charles Wright because of his injury, knowing he was not a serviceable quarterback that the coaches could really rely on. Um, yeah, we've talked, Chip and I have talked at length about this. You know, everyone wants to talk about the quarterback battle between Quinn Ewers and Arch Manning. It's like, no, the only quarterback battle going on on campus right now is Malik Murphy and Arch Manning as the backup. <laughs> and from what I had a source, I was at the, I guess it would have been the second scrim, not this past weekend, the weekend before, who was very open and said, it's clear Arch Manning, seeing him in person, it's very clear he's the third string quarterback. Um, that's not saying he's not talented. It's not saying that he was overhyped coming in. It's saying that he's the third string because he should be. I mean, he's a, you know, graduate high school or he should be probably going to prom like next weekend. <laughs> Let's be real about it. So, right. uh, yeah, I mean, this is or 
probably already went to prom. I don't know when that is anymore. But anyway, yeah, I mean, this is going to be really interesting to see the development of the backup quarterback. But I really am looking at Malik Murphy. That's the one I really want to see. We haven't had much opportunity to see him even in practice because he was held out that first week of spring before spring break when uh, he stayed in Austin to go through rehab. But, you know, guys like Greg Biggins, the 24-7 sports national recruiting analyst, I trust him. I trust his judgment. I trust his his eye when it comes. I mean, he's, you know, the guys that work in those roles, Brandon Huffman's, you know, all, all of the list goes on. Steve Wilfong's, all of them. Like, I trust them wholeheartedly when it comes to rating quarterbacks. And Greg Biggins was in charge of rating um, Malik Murphy being the West Coast recruiting analyst. And if his ceiling is as high as what Greg Biggins believes it could be, then this is a very, very talented kid. And I'm going to be very intrigued to watch his progression over the next couple of years, assuming hopefully if you're a Texas fan that they can keep him on campus. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, uh, I think it's important that he's um, the number two quarterback. He's obviously got to earn it. He's got to stay there. Mm -hmm. Um, And he's got to, he and Arch Manning both have to make big jumps in in their growth and development over the summer going into fall camp uh, because there is no Hudson card on this roster. And we know that having a backup quarterback who can go in and win games, uh, we know from last year in the Big 12, we know from Texas having to experience that, uh, how important it is. And mm-hmm. and so – TCU, um, Max Duggan was a backup quarterback. <laughs> yep. And Will Howard at K-State, he was yeah, not a starter yeah. either. So, um, and, and so, yeah, that that's, I, I'm with you. I want to see number six, Malik Murphy. I want to see number uh, 16, Arch Manning um, in their, in their development. And we'll get a little, little glimpse of it in the, uh, in the orange white game. Do not look for Texas's answer at punter in the orange white game because he's still not here yet. Ryan Sanborn, the, the graduate transfer from Stanford will get here in June. So, um, Bert Auburn and his giant, uh, orange hair, burn orange hair will be, uh, will be out there kicking some field goals. You got Will Stone on kickoffs. Uh, you got Xavier worthy on punt returns. Uh, Keelan Robinson, obviously not going to be, uh, out there on kick return. So we'll see, we'll see if we get, um, you know, a little glimpse of who could, uh, who could threaten uh, in terms of being a return specialist for Texas. Um, but Taylor, um, any other thoughts before we move on to uh, just a quick hit of basketball and then get into love it or leave it? I would say the only thing, if you're looking, if you're attending the Texas spring game, um, I, I and you're looking at Arch Manning say for the first time in a Texas uniform, he's a much bigger guy than I thought. Like when he, I, I like it, he's a his stature is, I don't know what I was thinking it would be because obviously all of the Mannings are pretty big guys, but for some reason I just kind of assumed he was just kind of like a Quinn Ewers or smaller maybe type of quarterback. He's a he's a big guy too. I mean, him and Malik Murphy are going to be very hard. Number six and number sixteen. Obviously, they're wearing black jerseys, so it's hard to miss them to begin with. But they're both, I, I would say, if you're a Texas fan, you haven't seen Arch Manning in person in football pads, like full pads. I think you'll be a little surprised with how big he is because I was I was taken aback by that. Yeah. And then Arch Manning standing next to Malik Murphy looks small. Yes, exactly. It's like <laughs> it's like Malik Murphy's the dad. He's like the big brother. And then Quinn Ewers is like the runt of the litter or something, which is funny to say, because Quinn's so talented. It's not a knock on Quinn. It's just they're the other two make him kind of, I almost said something I probably shouldn't, but you made him look much smaller than what he, uh, he probably is next to normal size people. <laughs> well, and JT Sanders said the passes are different that Malik Murphy, the ball whistles through the air. I'm not kidding. Yeah. Um, and JT Sanders said that dude, puts heat on the football. I mean, you have to be ready uh, mm-hmm. to catch his ball because it is on you in a heartbeat. And uh, that's one of the things that Malik Murphy has to learn. He's got to learn to use his eyes better uh, and not just rely on that cannon and, and look at receivers because um, 
you know, defensive backs are smart enough. They'll bait him into throwing interceptions, which I think has happened this spring. And, uh, and so Malik Murphy's got to develop that, uh, that use of his eyes. And that's one of the compliments that uh, Quinn Ewers has been getting from the defensive backs. Jody Barron said he still has not picked off Quinn Ewers this entire spring and that he's upset about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, because last year he said he would show up to practice and be like, I'm picking you off today. And then he would pick him off. Yeah. He said, I have not gotten a, a pick off of Quinn all spring. And he said he's doing a much better job. Even when we're in disguise, he said, um, Quinn's doing a better job of, of, you know, manipulating the defensive backs with his eyes and, and, you know, creating space for his receivers to get a little bit more open. And, and that's what you want to hear. If you're a, a Texas fan, uh, from the, you know, from the quarterback perspective and, um, you know, this is, uh, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. I'm actually, you know, really looking forward to it. Some spring games you're kind of like, uh, but there's, there's just a lot of momentum uh, in the program, primarily from off the field, you know, recruiting and, and being able to land guys in the portal. And um, you know, they've, they've just uh, done a really good job of building this roster, transforming this roster. And now it's, it's time to, to, you know, get it sharpened up and, and, you know, put it to the test in the, in the big 12 battle this fall, but there is anticipation, excitement. And, um, and so you know, a lot of, a lot of new faces, a lot of uh, position battles. We just mentioned plenty for you to be excited about um, come Saturday at, at one o'clock Taylor um, Texas basketball, uh, Frank Haith, familiar face to um, Texas basketball fans is going to be the associate head coach under Rodney Terry. I think this is fantastic. Frank Haith was actually the one who gave um, Rodney Terry the advice back in the day when Kelvin Sampson was trying to hire Rodney Terry. He told him, if you ever want to coach at Texas, you got to turn that one down. And, and Rodney Terry did. He ultimately joined um, Frank Haith under Rick Barnes at Texas. And now, uh, Frank Haith, who was at Memphis under uh, Penny Hardaway, uh, is going to leave Memphis to come to Texas as Rodney Terry's associate head coach, another coach who understands the landscape here, has recruiting relationships from his time here. Uh, I think this is a, a great fit. And with the expansion, the NCAA Division I Council uh, expanded the number of assistant coaches you can have from three to five. And so with that, uh, Rodney Terry should be able to keep whoever he wants from the previous staff. Now we've reported that John Riley, the strength coach is leaving the program. We told you uh, in the insider that was likely to happen because he was Chris Beard's strength coach at Texas tech all five years came with him to Texas look for him to resurface at Ole Miss, but um, Bob Donawalt, um, Steve McLean, Brandon Chapel, uh, they have a chance to stay on this staff. So we'll see if, uh, if that is indeed the case. And obviously Arterio Morris, the, the five-star, um, you know, guard who came in as a freshman this past season and really showed a lot of improvement. Um, a guy I was really excited about has entered the transfer portal. Now, um, this was not a surprise to the coaching staff. They did not want him to do it, obviously, but, um, you know, I'm told there's a chance he would reconsider, but, uh, anytime a player gets into the portal, it's pretty serious. And, um, and so we'll see now Texas is recruiting heavily out of the portal at Arterio Morris's position. And I think the coaches were upfront about him with that. Um, it, you know, you got to have depth. It doesn't mean they're looking to replace you, uh, but you got to have depth. Uh, and Texas is going to go after the best players in the portal at the guard position at, you know, in the front court, wherever. So, um, you know, Rowan Brumbaugh who came in in that recruiting class as well, red shirted this season has already committed to Georgetown. He's from the Northeast. He was recruited heavily uh, by Ed Cooley. Who's the new coach at, Georgetown when Cooley was at Providence. And I think, um, 
I think Roan Brumbaugh wanted to get back closer to home. And so um, you saw him uh, make the move in the portal and is now committed to Georgetown. So uh, we'll keep you posted, of course, on all the latest developments involving Texas football and basketball. Um, Taylor, we'll, we'll spend more time on baseball next week. Um, but, uh, you know, I'll just say Minchie mania, Kobe Minchie, the freshman who got the start against Texas state on Monday, three scoreless innings looked good. Let's, let's hope that continues because, um, what a breath of fresh air that would be to have a freshman reliever, uh, with that much poise and confidence. Texas state is no joke. And that was an impressive performance. All right. You ready for some love it or leave it? I am. Before we get to love it or leave it, we're going to take a really quick break, but stay tuned. We have more preview of the Texas spring game coming up. We'll be right back. And if you're watching us on the Horns 24-7 YouTube channel, we will continue on to love it or leave it here. All right, Chip, my first love it or leave it for you. You ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. <clears throat> love it or leave it. Three-point stance. <laughs> Until we know. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Sorry. Got my neck roll. <laughs> my mouth right. in. <laughs> you look like it too. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Those goggles or goggles, not glasses, right? Yeah, yeah. Wearing there. yeah. My All right. <laughs> yeah. Goggles. All right. <laughs> my first one for you is love it or leave it. Until we know who Texas lead running back is, it's hard to get too excited about the Longhorns offense. You know what? I'll love this. I'll love this right now. Um, yeah, I think, I think we do need more information. We need more, um, more importantly, we need to know how confident Steve Sarkeesian is in his running back room in a game. You know, how is he going to call the game? It, it, does he, um, it, does he trend toward a pass first pass to set up the run offense like he kind of tried to do in the Alamo bowl, but not really. Um, or does he believe that he's got a running back room that can be the pro style offense that Steve Sarkeesian likes to run. And he, you know, he talks all the time. We want to run the football. We want to run the football because to be effective in the deep throwing game, the defense has to respect the run, right. um, but I'll just, I'll love this right now because I haven't seen what we've got. And, um, you know, Steve Sarkeesian may know already right now, based on what he's seen in these, you know, 13 going on 15 spring practices, what he's got at the running back position. But because I don't know, I'm going to love this Taylor. How about you? Man, I'm kind of like, I'm a little torn because I, I kind of want to love it, but I'm not necessarily sure if it has to do with the Texas lead running back at this point, because I, I think that Texas has options there. Obviously you want to have a one guy, I think. And I think Steve Sarkeesian has all but said that without saying it, right? Like when he was asked about it, it's like, well, you know, I've always had a 1,000 yard rusher every single time I've been calling an offense. But Did he jinx I himself? Be, Did he I jinx know, himself? exactly. Exactly. But then he follows it up with like, but I, I would be okay with doing more of a running back by committee. So his answers make me think that it's, it is a little bit of a concern. Um, I would say it would be hard for me to get too excited about the Longhorns offense until I see full go the passing game. Cause that was a priority. Um, I, I would say that might be a little bit more so than the running game. And I know it's probably, I don't know. Like I'm, I'm torn on this. I kind of, maybe I'll just leave it because I'm not going to say it's the running backs. I think that there's, there's a different, there's a, a couple of things that need to, that I need to see before I'm going to get too excited about the offense starts with Quinn Ewers, his development. I, I think it's, I think it's on pace. I, I expect I've said this, before I know this probably is another one people are like shut up I expect a Sam Ellinger s type of year one to year two jump and if you look at their numbers they're kind of similar from their freshman year you know and then you hope that the sophomore year it turns out like 
Sam Ellinger's 2018 season at Texas. But um, I think that's there. I think the receivers are going to be better, but I haven't seen it yet. So I would say I'm going to leave this because I'm not too focused on the lead running back. I just want to see the whole offense and the priorities that Steve Sarkeesian has placed at the top of his list. I want to see that in action first. And those were the passing games. So I'm going to leave it for that. Okay. All right. I just talk in the full circle. I think I did, but <laughs> no, I talk I, myself I, out of it. <laughs> I, I see where you're going there. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right. Love it or leave it. Number two. All right. Second one, love it or leave it. Despite losing Moro Ojimo, Keandre Coburn, DeMarvian Overshown, Ovia Gofu, Anthony Cook, and Deshaun Jameson, you expect UT's defense to be better in 2023. Um, you know what? I'm going to love this because um, even though Jalen Catalan has been, you know, uh, held out of the spring for the most part. I think there's enough talent. Um, and I think, you know, knock on wood, if Jalen Catalan is healthy, uh, let's, let's make that the hypothetical. If, if, if guys are healthy, then I think this defense does have a chance because I think Baron Sorrell is going to take an, another step. I think Alfred Collins is showing that he's finally ready. Um, Vernon Broughton has has been um, a, a plug and play player, and we've I've reported about the heavy defensive line that Texas will use uh, when they're you know trying to keep a team out of the end zone down on the goal line where they'll put uh, Alfred Collins, Vernon Broughton, Tavondre Sweat, and Byron Murphy all on the line together. Um, this talk about Anthony Hill having you know this special talent as a pass rusher, you know, kind of reminds me of Tony Brackens. They're not built the same way, but Tony Brackens always got his hands on the football and knocked it loose. Just had a gift and a knack for it. Um, and I think, you know, even though you've got some, um, you know, questions, about who will take over for DeMarvian Overshone. David Bend has been on campus four years. It's time. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, I'm going to love this. Despite losing all those players you mentioned, I do expect UT's defense to be better in 2023. Taylor, how about you? Uh, I want to love it, but I also kind of want to leave it too, because I feel like, I, that that's so much experience. I mean, look at the number of players I had to read off, right? I mean, those are those are longtime starters. A lot of times it's difficult to replace them, but I will say, I think you bring up a good point talking about David Bend has been on campus for four years. We're not talking about these guys leaving in true freshmen only or true sophomores only being in place to take over. That was kind of what Texas had in from 2018 to 2019, right? Like there was expectations for the defense to continue to progress um, in year three under Tom Herman, and it did the opposite. But I think people didn't count out or they, you know, forgot the fact or didn't want to acknowledge the fact that the guys they had to replace the veteran starters that they lost were not experienced players at all. They were underclassmen, and that's what led to that. So I think I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna love it actually because. I can't keep comparing things to the past, right? Like Steve Sarkeesian's changed the trajectory. I think he's changed the trajectory of this program. He's overhauled the entire roster. And because of the experience, the the um, the older guys they do have returning, they may not be as experienced as all of the guys they're losing. I think they may have a higher upside than some of those guys too. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna love it. I'm gonna say I expect UT's defense to be slightly better in 2023 i'm not saying light the world on fly or number one defense in the country but i i could i could see them being better so yeah i'll love it yeah i mean <laughs> one of my bigger concerns and maybe the only reason i would leave it is you don't have gary patterson yeah uh scouting and putting together the the game plans for for this coaching staff that that was a big deal and yeah. We know Gary's, you know, taking some time off. Now he has said, he told me, and I reported this, that, you know, if I find myself getting the itch come August, I may call Steve 
Sarkeesian and say, hey, Steve, uh, do you have me back? Yeah. But, but we can't count on that because, um, you know, Gary definitely wanted to spend some more time with his wife, Kelsey, and um, their grandchildren. And so, um, but that's a big, that's a big loss. All right. That's a big uh, loss. Yeah, for sure. All right. Love it or leave it number three. All right, final one. You guys will, everyone listening will know that this was a chip, love it or leave it, but I'm going to pose it to you still. Love it or leave it. The biggest sporting event on campus on Saturday is the battle between number one Texas men's tennis against number two TCU in Austin at 7 p.m. for the Big 12 title. Well, <laughs> if I gave you your platform, go ahead and talk. <laughs> if we're talking about hardware, <laughs> Then I'm going to love this. Now, obviously, the spring game, orange-white game, is easily the biggest sporting event on campus on Saturday. But you got the number one and number two teams in the country, and they're playing for the third time, Texas and TCU. Uh, TCU beat Texas at the National Indoors. Texas beat TCU in Fort Worth in a non-conference match because there's only six teams that play tennis in the Big 12. So... Um, they scheduled each other as a non-conference match. And now this is the one to decide the Big 12 regular season title. So maybe find a way to hang out on campus and, and meander over to the Texas Tennis Center at 7 o'clock because uh, this, this will be good um, big-time college tennis. Could, these two teams could meet for the national championship. So um, I'll leave it, but, you know, give – Give the give the tennis team some love. Taylor, how about you? Yeah, I'm going to leave it too. But I'm curious. Have you played pickleball? Because Chip, if you if you know, if you listen to this, you know that I always rip on Chip for being a country club kid with his tennis and golf and all of that. But um, yes, pickleball, Chip, what, what's your what's your take on pickleball? You know what? With my knees in the condition they're in, I'm still trying to play tennis at a high level. <laughs> I'm I'm getting more and more. Um, you know, comfortable with the idea of moving to pickleball because uh, it's kind of like a cross between tennis and ping pong. Yeah. Uh, have you played pickle? I haven't, but I, um, I've i had some conversations with, it was my brother-in-law recently and he was like, oh my gosh, I would never want to play you in pickleball because I'm really good at ping pong. And I was pretty good at tennis. And he's like, you, I just, he's, he wants me to start that is a hobby because he's like, you'll just destroy some fools. He's like, I just really want to see it. So now I'm like intrigued, but I haven't tried yet. There's one in my, at my a pickleball court, not at my house itself, but like in the area I live in, there is one. And there's an instructor that does lessons. A part of me is like, I don't know. I've never taken lessons before. I feel like my brothers will never let me live it down if I take pickleball lessons of all things. But I'm kind of intrigued. I don't know. It's like the fastest growing sport in America. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I figured that you would probably try this since you're, you know, a tennis fiend. So I wasn't I've sure. played it. It's fun. It's yeah. fun. And you can get good fast. It's it's different from tennis, but you know, some of the same strokes don't work. Like top spin doesn't work in pickleball. Mm -hmm. It's more of a slap. Um, and you gotta know when to play light in the kitchen and then, you know, pick up the pace and try and hit it by him. But I, I like it. I like it. And I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding. I'm getting more comfortable with, with moving over to pickle. Cause I'm, I'm playing against younger and younger guys in tennis and it's tough. It's tough yeah. out there for an old man. <laughs> we may need to have a horns 24 seven pickleball challenge. See if uh, you can keep up with a older, younger woman. <laughs> older. Great. <laughs> yeah. Great. That there's See, I, there's a situation those, where I have those, uh, nothing to gain and everything to lose. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Pretty much. All right. Because <laughs> well, I'm listen, a very sore loser too. Like <laughs> we will we will keep you all posted on the the pickle <laughs> pickleball challenge. Uh, but until then, hope everyone has uh, has a great weekend. Hope some of you can get out to the spring game and uh, and check out everything we just talked about. Thanks so much for listening. Um, for Taylor Estes, I am Chip Brown. Uh, until next time, we'll see you over at horns247.com. Stay safe and keep the faith.